Let me stress that this presentation is only for experienced developers who are familiar with high voltage circuits. If you're not familiar with electronics, there is a tutorial at www.freeenergyinfo.com stroke tutorial.pdf. The South African developer says, I have built the Solovey replication as close to his version as I am able to do with the materials available to me. Solovey's original circuit is shown here. Very simple, very straightforward. Driven typically by a 12 volt battery, which of course can charge up to 14 volts if necessary. And it's just a simple resistor divider feeding the base of a transistor, which has got two coils, which provide feedback to itself and generate a magnetic field. In his presentation, the uh, diagram, circuit diagram there, is his figure number two. The South uh, African developer says, this is my slightly modified version. I've introduced a variable resistor to control the current to the base of the transistor. And this is a photograph of the actual implementation as he has particularly built it. I'm using a TIP3055 transistor. I've tried a large range of transistors, MJE13009, TIP132, and all sorts of others. And the only ones which work at all are the 2SC3552, which is a 1000 volt transistor, and the TIP3055, which is the best by far. These are my coil details, and in this table he shows the particular winding type and lengths used in the different versions of the coils. He says, initially I tried Solovey's primary coil L1 with eight turns and a diameter of 700 millimeters. Uh, I beg your pardon, of 70 millimeters but had far better results with only three to four turns. My criteria for assessing these things were the strength of the corona at the top of the secondary coil, L2, and the degree of fluorescence produced in a nearby handheld compact fluorescent lamp, as well as the distance of the lamp from the coil. This is a photograph here of the implementation. That's L2 there and around it is L1. And he says the white wires are not connected. They're just being used as spacers. I then tried a larger primary L1 coil with many more turns of thicker copper wire on which I could vary the number of turns and also the position vertically of L1 relative to L2. I found that the larger diameter seemed to produce an enlarged magnetic field which was better, but the wire thickness and the vertical position in this instance was not at all critical. Interestingly though, in every variation the optimum number of turns in the L1 coil was 3 to 4. I presume that this is the best resonant match with the secondary L2 coil in its present form. This is a photograph of his L1 coil which can be adjusted. You can adjust the position vertically depending on where it clips the two wires and the number of turns in the coil as the number of turns between the two clipped connections. And he says this is typical of the fluorescence produced in a compact fluorescent light bulb and the corona produced at the top of the coil. He says, I then me measured the voltage at L2 empirically and found it able to charge a one microfarad capacitor 
very rapidly to 2000 volts. I presume the recti rectified AC voltage to be far higher, at least in the multi kilovolt range. I feel that the formula mentioned by Solovey, namely U2 equals UM divided by N1 times N2, does not necessarily apply to this type of Tesla configuration, so I question his calculation of 700 to 800 volts. I was unable to measure the frequency accurately with my handheld oscilloscope, but the reading which it displayed seemed to hover around the 300 kilohertz mark. It may be much higher. I then con configured a capacitor to withstand high voltages of, by calculation, variable between 0 picofarads and 800 to 900 picofarads. Uh, the coil, the capacitor rather, would be used in this position with a lot of high voltage diodes forming a single high voltage diode uh, in the particular circuit. His construction of this variable capacitor is shown here in this photograph. In all subsequent tests, he says, I found that the introduction of this capacitor between L2 and ground, which admittedly I could tune to optimize re resonance, increased the current draw from the supply battery to such a degree that three TIP 3055s in parallel exploded and burnt out in seconds. They can each handle 15 amps, so I measured the current as accurately as I could with both digital and analog meters and found that it could easily exceed 40 amps. This is why I've used such a massive heatsink. Also, the voltage present at the top of L2 immediately drops when the capacitor to ground connection is present. This can't be good as far as coil L3 is concerned. He says, I used the same lamps as Solovey, that's 21 watts, 12 volts, in series with the capacitor from L2 to ground, namely there. So between L2 and the capacitor connecting to ground is where the bulbs are located. The lamp burnt out in seconds, but what I feel that Solovey has failed to indicate in his paper uh, is that the current draw does not remain as his measured 0.3 amps drawn from the supply battery. When a capacitor is connected to ground as shown in this diagram. This means that although the lamp is experiencing a current of two or more amps, one cannot calculate overall wattage based on the product of the voltage times the current when the supply current is now extremely high. I then moved on to the next phase, which included a lamp across L3. Uh, this is the extra winding here, it's 10 turns feeding the lamp, going through its variable capacitor to ground. The lamp burnt out again, and I introduced a high wattage variable resistor of, of 100 ohms in the supply line to limit the possibility of high current and pro to protect the transistor by that mechanism. He says I usually had the variable resistor set to 50 ohms. So he's talking about a high wattage 50 ohm resistor in that position. I then decided to remove the capacitor to ground and replace it with a spherical aluminium globe. This provides capacitance to the ambient surroundings, which proves to be a considerable improvement as far as the performance of L3 is concerned. It also reduces the corona discharge losses, so that the lamp now burns brightly and the compact fluorescent lamp still fluoresces when held near the L2 winding. 
This indicates that the voltage at L2 is no longer dropping in spite of the load imposed by L3 and the lamp. This is the arrangement at the top of the L2 coil. So the unit with his aluminium sphere at the top looks like this. He says, I was able to, sp to dispense with the 100 ohm resistor as the current draw from the 12 volt supply battery was now down to 2 amps, which is a much more reasonable uh, amount, but still more than Solovey's 0.3 amps. Having got thus far, I moved on to Don Smith's next stage, which was to replace the lamp with a bridge rectifier on coil 3. The black wires in this case are just spacers, they're not connected. And the lamp operates well. Voltage across the capacitor rose to well over a thousand volts, so I stopped the experiment as I was afraid it would damage my digital meter. I then thought of trying two extra coils simultaneously, and I did that by putting a second bridge rectifier over the black wire coil, which had previously just been used as a spacer. With the that arrangement done, the circuit became this here. And now there are two simultaneous DC outputs of 1500 volts each. I put a voltage divider across my analog meter to measure this. Here you can see my meter set to the 1000 volt range. I realize that this is a low power version of Don Smith circuits and one cannot expect much from it. I know that Don Smith in order to achieve very high outputs in terms of kilowatts relied very much on resonance in his circuits. What I'm investigating here is simply Solovey's attempt to demonstrate that a greater output than input is possible. He did not seem to carry it any further as he had achieved his objective as part of the university degree, degree attempt which he was making. From my experience with these high voltage pulses, or in this case high frequency AC circuits, is that it is possible to achieve very high voltages from a simple 12 volt system, but that in general there is not very much power available unless one can achieve the advantage of resonance in some form or another. In a very basic experiment, I have tried the following circuit, which is just a simply simple battery charging circuit, but it's not charging any load directly. This is the circuit here, as before, with two L3 coils, two rectifiers, one supplies in the, the battery to be charged, and one feeding back to the battery which is driving the circuit. He says using that, after one hour of operation, the drive battery had dropped from 13 volts to 12.9 volts and had, had a very dead 12 volts 7 amp hour battery had risen from 3.3 volts to 6.3 volts and is holding that 6.3 volts now. I'm sure that a battery in better condition would have charged even better and I will try it. When a battery charge load is applied to the extra coils the compact fluorescent lamp will no longer fluoresce. I observed that a real earth connection has helped a little. My current draw from the 12 volt battery supply using both extra coils in this configuration is only 0.4 amps which is 400 milliamps. This experiment suggests to me that one might make many extra pickup coils like the above of three to four turns each placed along the length of L2 with L1 at the very bottom. This would bear out Don Smith's claim that one can draw multiple sources of energy from an inductive magnetic field without increasing the load on the supply. There's obviously much more scope for experimentation with this type of low voltage solid state Tesla coil. 
He says, I've retested and duplicated my results so far, and in the process I discovered something of small significance. Developer Ming Kao has mentioned in his comments, which are in www.freeenergyinfo.com stroke chapter 3.pdf page 186, that he found an improvement when he placed the primary coil and the pickup coil far apart on opposite ends of the secondary coil L2. I did this and found a definite increase in voltage output. What I think is happening is that the section of L2 between L1 and L3 is being increased. This is a photograph of the arrangement that he's using. He says, I have vertically flipped coil L1 so that the three active windings are now at the bottom. And I move the pickup L3 right to the top of the L2 coil. I also notice that the output in this configuration increased substantially when I removed the aluminium globe and just left the open end of the Perspex tube at the top of L2. This is good news, as these metal spheres are not easy to find. What has taken place as I have experimented is that I have gradually dispensed with all capacitive components with improved results. This is important to me, as I seem to have moved from LC resonance to resonance between the coil windings only. As LC resonance is very difficult to achieve in complex circuits, whereas coil to coil resonance can more easily be achieved by calculation and careful measurement, this discovery is welcome. The last stage is an interesting one, since I now felt that I was no longer dealing primarily with LC resonance and therefore the magnetic field was more dominant in energy transfer than was the electric field, I thought of Don Smith's multi-coil power source. I want another coil with materials I had in order to try coil-to-coil -coil energy transference. This new coil is 50 millimeters in diameter and the winding is 400 millimeters in length. Wound with 0.5 millimeter diameter diameter enameled solid copper wire. This has resulted in 800 turns and I will call this coil L2B. I have it standing as you can see next to the primary device and the only connection is from the bottom of L2B to common ground. So in other words he's saying this is the only connection to this L2B coil and he tested that particular configuration and found that the compact fluorescent lamp would light up from the L2B coil. At the top of the second coil in the first picture is a string of 10 1N4007 thousand volt diodes connected in series and the voltage output to ground on both coils simultaneously is 2100 volt at each coil. I have moved the L2B coil up to 70 centimeters away from L2 which is as far as my wires would reach and at that distance the voltage output of L2B remains 2100 volts. What this demonstrates to my satisfaction is that Don Smith's suggestion based on the followed following drawing here will work in practice. This drawing shows five L2 coils surrounded by one small number of turns L1 coil. He says, I have not yet come across any really successful replications of Don Smith's devices, so this is reassuring to me. What's interesting is that as I move L2B away from L2, the voltage drops and rises 
by increments of about 5 to 10 percent at incremental distances of about 20 centimeters. For convenience, the coils uh, in a real construction would need to be much more closely spaced, but the width of the field is amazing. It also should suggest that the arrangement of the coils should be done carefully and empirically. Something I wish to stress in closing, he says, is that I have in no case paid any attention to the quarter or half wavelength issue of the relative lengths of the primary to secondary wires or ratios. None of my coils have any calculated wavelength ratios or measurements and yet have achieved for a low power solid state device quite demonstrable results. I think that Richard Quick's essay on the practical aspects of resonance is most impressive and useful. It's reproduced below. But an issue I find unresolved is this. If the LC component of resonance is replaced by the magnetic component, then we're dealing with a longitudinal wave, which as I understand is a defining characteristic of cold electricity. And we're not dealing with a transverse wave. A standing wave as determined by wavelength resonance is essentially a transverse wave phenomenon with clearly defined nodes. A longitudinal wave will not have nodes. This is a contradictory issue which is not yet clear to me and maybe is a field worth investigating by other developers. Solio's Solovey's details are available via that link there and this is the uh, discussion of Richard Quick on the link up between uh, coil lengths and resonance. I leave you to read th that through because it's worth considering carefully as you read and it's fairly lengthy and very detailed. I suggest that you do take the time to have a read through it and consider what it is that's been said in that. So that concludes the presentation here in this video which is primarily on the work of our friendly South African developer. So that indeed is the sum of this video.